Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello friends and listeners and welcome to a new episode of the Thought Hermes podcast. Season 7 this is and episode 21 this is. Three more to go and we have finished our 24 episodes of season 7. No worries, there will be a season 8 coming with a week of interval but uh, the show must go on, of course. My name is Rudolf and I am your host, speaking to you from the outskirts of Vienna. And, well, today speaking from the outskirts of Vienna is a kind of um, part of the game because our guest here today, well, he is from Los Angeles. Okay, so far you don't get the point. You know what? As this is a bit a kind of a special topic, a kind of a special episode here today, I strongly suggest that those of you who normally skip what I'm saying before the interview, don't do it this time, because I'm going to explain a bit more about that before we actually start the interview. And um, so after the first piece of music, I'll give you some background to the topic of this interview and uh, also why I wanted to do it. You know, I like to do artsy things from time to time. So today is an artsy episode and it's not uh, purely esoteric only, even though the topic Alphonse Mucha, which we are going to talk about, is deeply esoterically rooted. Curious? Good. So you will get the point uh, after the first piece of music. But before that, let me greet everyone who is here for the first time. Welcome to this show. Welcome to the Thought Hermes podcast. And of course, uh, an equal welcome to all of you who are returning listeners, who are those who have been with me for over 110 episodes so far. It's great to have you back as well. And greetings especially to those of you who are patrons of this show. You make this possible and, well, I have to tell it again, I need more of you. Please, guys, uh, go to the website. Uh, the website is thoshermes.com. You know it by now, thoshermes.com, spelled T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S.com. And um, when you're there, you will find that nice Patreon button, which will bring you directly to a page where you can choose from $1 per show upwards. You can become a patron. And, well, we really do need you to create Season 8 and after that Season 9 and 10. If you want that, please join the patrons. And if you prefer just one single off donation, any amount, we are grateful, then there is the donation button on that first page of the website as well. But while you're at the website you should also go and see about all the previous episodes. All of them are there, can be found there, and you can give me feedback. And that kind of feedback is really what I like, what I need, and what I want to have from you. So feedback can be given through regular email, info at thoughtshermes.com, but on the website you have a special contact page where you can write to me, and you also have... Of course, that voicemail button, which would be nice to hear your voice from time to time. And if you want to leave a message for all the listeners here, do let me know. You can go leave a voicemail there and I will play it on the show next week. Okay, so um, what else did I want to say? Well, Thomas de Govan, as I said, and I are going to talk about Alphonse Mucha. And that explains also the choice of the music here today. Because Alphonse Mucha, you're going to hear all about it in the interview and in my intro to it before. Um, of course, he's by his name. Some of you might have guessed it and others know it. He is a very famous Czech artist um, who lived in the late 19th century. But he 
made a big, big, important part of his career. And he grew up with his career actually in Paris, France. And therefore, I chose music from his period in France first, French music, and then a bit later on, Czech music. Um, both pieces have a relation to his work, actually. And um, in between, it's Thomas de Govan. Uh, he has a Negovan, actually. I have to pronounce him correctly because I have this European habit to pronounce his name. You'll get more about that also during the interview. But it's Negovan. That's the way he's pronounced in the United States where he lives. He was born in Chicago, but he lives now in the LA area. So, and so the third piece of music is performed by himself. Um, well, let's start with that first piece of music, which is the French one. So those French and Czech pieces of music I have chosen from my personal field and knowledge, classical music. Uh, from time to time, you hear classical music on this show. So today it's the case again, the first and the third piece. And this first piece, well, most of you, I'm sure, know that piece, even if you are not classic buffs, because you've heard about Claude Debussy, of course, famous French composer. And there is this piece, a piano piece called Claire de Lune, which we hear all the time in movies, uh, in lounge music, all over the place. Claire de Lune is a very, very famous piece. But today, we don't hear a version for piano. Today, we will hear a version uh, for orchestra. There is an orchestra version, which he did not do himself, but it's often performed this time by the Frankfurt Radio Symphony Orchestra with Jean-Christophe Spinozzi, so French guy, as their conductor. So let's delve right away into Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune in its orchestral version. Enjoy.
Claire de Lune by Claude Debussy in an orchestra version, a bit unusual maybe for most of you, but I'm sure the piano version is very well known to most people here. So, and now I told you I would explain you a little bit more about this episode, a um, bit more than usual maybe, but I don't read a text for you on the other hand, so that will come up to about the same level. Um, today my guest is Thomas Negoven. Thomas is an artist. He is a writer, he is a painter, he is a singer, you will hear that in the interval, and he has recently produced a wonderful, wonderful book on uh, art, an artist that I'm sure, like the music we just heard, you have certainly seen his work, maybe not knowing by who that was. Uh, that artist is Alphonse Mucha. He was a Czech painter, illustrator and graphic artist, but he lived in Paris during the Art Nouveau period. And Art Nouveau, that was kind of Art Deco, Art Nouveau was kind of almost created by him, if you can say a thing like that. He um, was born in 1860 in a town very close to actually where I live, but it is just across the Czech border today, and then it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And um, he then moved to Paris in the late, in towards the end of the century, so at the time when Claude Debussy also was working there. And he his works are really famous. Um, I will post one or two of his posters on the show notes of this website. And you have to go to this show notes because not only you find those two examples in order that you see who we are talking about, because Alphonse Mucha is most known by his posters, actually. But also you will find the links to the web pages of what is actually the central topic of this episode here today, which is that book that Thomas Negovan produced, a beautiful hardcover edition and an equally beautiful but the smaller and cheaper version in paperback um, about Alphonse Mucha's work, Le Pater. Le Pater means the father in French and it's actually about the Lord's Prayer. Um, because Alphonse Mucha made a book with texts and illustrations by him illustrations are beautiful beautiful on the lord's prayer and as alphonse Mucha was not exactly a um, devout catholic uh, who would be very much clinging to the catholic dogma he was a freemason he was a spiritist he was a real esoteric person and that's the reason why we present this book and this um, this work here today on the show because Thomas de Govan, even if he is not an esotericist himself, um, like most of our guests are, but he has a deep insight into the life and work of Alphonse Mucha. And we are having, a, I believe, a wonderful discussion on that topic. As I said, a bit different from what you might be used to here on the show. But I like from time to time to give you new things to look at, to think about, and hopefully to discover. Um, we did that recently with a little bit of new age, and we did that recently with gaming and esotericism. So I like from time to time go a bit away from the central um, topics uh, about grimoires and magic and uh, that kind of thing, because I think we as occultists need to be curious and also go to the fringe areas of our art, the occult art, which we all love and most of us also practice, or many of us at least here also practice. So I do hope you will enjoy that show. And um, once again, I know I'm annoying you, but um, go to the website, go and look at the, at the show notes of this show and use the links there and find out more about Thomas Negovan, his work and that work by Alphonse Mucha that he republished with his own texts. It is really worth the while. Okay, so I will come back uh, with music performed by Thomas Negovan. Negovan, um, I have to be careful not to pronounce it always in the European way. Um, and um, we will come back in about half an hour uh, with that music. And for now, Let's go to Los Angeles, meet Thomas Negovan, and let's speak about 
Alfons Mucha. Here comes the interview. And today I'm very happy to welcome on the Sauce Hermes podcast, Thomas Negoven from, well, actually he's from Chicago, but he now is in Los Angeles where he lives. Thomas, or Tom, uh, if I may say Tom. Um, yes, um, please. Uh, hello. Nice to have you on the show and good evening you. to you. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, actually, uh, we were brought together by one of your, I think, numerous artistic projects, which relates to the esoteric and mystical world of the late 19th century. Um, and that was a wonderful, wonderful edition of Alphonse Mucha's Le Pater. Um, we go more into that a bit at a later stage, but I had to mention the reason why the two of us met here. Um, and when then I a bit deeper in what you were doing it at some point I thought hmm, that guy must be somebody who is very much into late 19th century um, imagery arts because even the photos of yourself that you that you sent me for announcing the podcast you look like a bit of, like a figure from back that time and um, <laughs> so tom um, before we go deeper into our subject talk to me about yourself present yourself to our audience and maybe at some point you can explain if i'm completely wrong with what i said or if not no, why i'm 182 years old those photographs are period <laughs> And uh... <laughs> okay, so this is, in fact, ladies and gentlemen, this is a show about spiritualism. <laughs> I, uh, no, let, let's be serious. Yeah. I mean, my, my work background is, uh, as it relates to the 19th century, is that I've uh, run a gallery for over 20 years that specializes in 1880 through 1920. So kind of the symbolist era through the Weimar Republic. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, uh, prior to that, I, I worked as a musician and I've done that concurrently. I do also uh, do some work in, in the film realm and the thing that relates to what we're talking about today is that as much as I've enjoyed mounting exhibitions for the last decades, um, books are like a message in a bottle. And so the Le Pater book was a way for me to present not only Alphonse Mucha's work, but to give people the context of understanding what led to it and what followed it. And so the the book publishing is, is something that I'm very proud of right now. Um, and the photographs that you mentioned, I mean, I try to, you know, everything kind of has an overlap in the Venn diagram. I did a recording Uh, I released a record that was completely analog. It was recorded without electricity. Uh, we recorded to wax cylinder, took it to tape and then to vinyl. And so for the album cover, uh, there was a photographer in Ohio named Greg Martin, who I love. And I drove to visit him and we went to the neighborhood, big open turn of the century graveyard and he took uh, wet plate photography uh, photographs of me for the album cover. So part of it was taking the project all the way to its end uh, end result aesthetically. So the record was released with a cover that was photographed using the same technology of the era in which the recordings were made. Right. And before we go on, I have to mention to our audience that the recording you just mentioned the, that will be also played in the in the break. I always do that break, as people here know, in the middle of our interview. And we will there hear that recording, that wax recording that you just mentioned. So very exciting because in 2022, we hardly imagine that something can be recorded without electricity, can we? Yeah. The, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you quickly, the reason that I did it was, <clears throat> excuse me, I had purchased this massive recording console that interestingly enough belonged to the band Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And it was a big oh, really? 1970s vintage console. And I was so intimidated by it that I, I kind of took a 90 degree turn and I thought, what if I just recorded 
where there were no options. Like the only options that existed were sing louder or move your chair. Like there's nothing that you could do. And so it was it, artistically, it was just a really interesting uh, discipline in the art of, of being immediate and present and also accepting the imperfections of a moment as being its own perfection. Um, so there was a lot, you know, we, we talked before we got on here about some of the esoteric traditions and some of those mindsets. And mm. one thing I might be able to clarify here from what we were talking about earlier is that for me, a lot of the rituals that I find are things like what I just said. And so perhaps it wasn't me reading a series of literary ideas or doing any kind of, you know, predetermined ritual, but in the act of creating this entire record, doing the photography kind of, you know, almost um, adopting uh, the the mindset of what it meant to create in that time and then looking at the lens of the 21st century through that. Uh, when I was working then on the Le Pater book I, and I'm reading about traditions and um, I feel like if we stripped away language and we stripped away books that a lot of us would discover some form of practice that would help us to find these truths mm -hmm. um, and that all of it is valuable and, and that we're all moving to the same place if we are keeping centered in the right way. But so, yeah, that was just kind of a weird aside. But uh, the that recording process was just it was a really interesting year of my life. I'm really grateful I did mm. it. With what you just were saying about moving all to the same focal point, maybe we could mention, we could call it, um, is yeah. of course actually a very hermetic thought in itself, right? And and yes. um, um, I find it interesting what you say about arts because uh, people who are regulars to this show know that uh, I often compare the arts, be it vocal arts, be it um, painting, be it all kinds of art forms, performing arts, um, to, to being a kind of magic, to, to create something by your own will that changes the, the changes reality to a certain extent, right? And yeah, when we talk completely. later on, uh, uh, when we talk later on a little bit, well, not a little bit, extensively on Alphonse Mucha, I think that will be a, a, a main a main subject that we have to to see how you how you feel about it there. Um, but before that, let's just um, stay with you for one more moment. But why? Why the 19th century? You could have said, okay, it's more whatever, uh, um, the Baroque period that interests me, or no, it's 1950 to 1957. Um, why, why the late 19th century? What was so attractive to you when you started digging into that? I think that I might have answered this question differently in, in previous decades. I think that it, it, with my understanding at this point, I think that what you had at that time was a post-industrial revolution reaction to technology. And so there, the increase in interest in mystical thinking, in um, metaphysical uh, you know, an appreciation for the idea that there's more to the world than meets the eye, that that was informing the art in such a great way. Uh, and so when you look at, you know, especially symbolist art as a movement, when you think about the Salon Rosa Croix and the, the artists that were working in the 1890s that were mm -hmm really subscribing to the idea like um, in The Little Prince, what is essential is invisible to the eye, that that's something that always resonated with me as a young person growing up in a very industrial era, very or area, uh, area, I mean, mm -hmm. very working class uh, upbringing, south side of Chicago. And so feeling very connected to poetry and music and art and um, you know, maybe for someone else, there's some angst attached to it. And for me, it was just always a curiosity. And I think that I saw that reflected in a lot of the late 19th century thinking. And 
I think also then the part of me that was interested in whether it's, you know, David Bowie or Prague Rock or any of that, where you start to then get into some of the thinking of it, of things as they move into the teens and the 20s. And it really culminates in the tension of the war exploding and then kind of the chaos that is the Weimar Republic. So after the war, mm. you had just this uh, landscape of of decadence and exhaustion and you know, kind of like, you know, just being bathed in sweat culturally. And so it's almost like for me, that's like a, a, an entire arc of a human story, starting with curiosity, ending in this uh, exhaustion and transcendence before a completely new cycle begins, which was mm -hmm. unfortunately the advent of Nazism and leading to the next world war and all of that but so that yeah that 18 yeah. 1880 through 1920 window for me just really encapsulates really some element of everything to me that's fascinating about mm -hmm. living on this planet uh, of course it was as you just mentioned a period when uh, the a real occult revival happened in the late 19th century starting in Basically, the 1860s, 1870s with Madame Blavatsky and then with the foundations of such orders like the, like the Golden Dawn, etc. And, and mm -hmm. yes, the arts world certainly played a hugely intense role in that. As you say, spiritualism uh, influenced uh, the art very Ye strongly as Yeats well. Yeats was my favorite poet when I was young, and I, long before I knew about the Golden Dawn. So I, I was connecting to that era that thinking um absolutely yeah i just and at the same time uh, the historians called it the time pre-world war one called it um, a dance on the volcano um, which they mean historically and uh, about fear of war or will of war on the other hand but also i i think we can just can translate that also into some artistic um expression can't we I th one thing that, and I was thinking this when I was speaking a minute ago, and this relates to what you just said, is that you also had, in coming kind of to Alphonse Mucha, you also had the advent of lithography, which meant that like Toulouse Lautrec posters being up on the wall, people were experiencing art in a way that they culturally hadn't before. You also had. Mm -hmm. salons opening you had after the industrial revolution a middle class for the first time so in decades prior if you weren't extremely wealthy uh your your experience with seeing things like oil paintings would have been extremely limited uh and so that's another thing that when you start in the 1960s and then move up to 1900 it's it's a very steep ramp of ascent of mm -hmm. of art mm -hmm. coming into people's lives in a much different way absolutely and when we talk about art let's always be inclusive with music with painting with theater with it it, it was all floating on that same on that same experience and mm -hmm. alphonse mucha uh, is an example when he created those affiche in paris the, the posters for for george sand and, and so on of course that was also this overlap between the art forms that was typical for the time right yeah and in mentioning music i think that and i'm less i'm less educated in this era or area i'm sorry uh the th my brain is moving faster than my mouth. I um <laughs> I think that what I meant is that you have like the advent of the celebrity. You know, before you had like Aristide Bruant, the man with the red scarf, or Sarah Bernhardt. I I think that of course they had places where people went to drink, but to go to a concert to see a celebrity performer, um, that's something that was pretty new in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. I think that's another reason I, I don't want to say I'm attracted to that 
era, but maybe there just aren't the same landmarks a couple decades earlier. And so my own curiosity just didn't find any places to plant a flag before that. Like that's that's yeah. probably what yeah. is the real answer there. Now, before we finally move to Alphonse Bucha and then to that beautiful, beautiful book that, that I have here in my hands, um, in, uh, you are from Chicago. You said you grew up the Chicago South Side. I think you live in L.A. now, don't you? I do. Yes. So and you created that museum there, which is quite an extraordinary thing. Um, how... What what made you build that bridge? I, I mean, I live here. I, I live here. I'm surrounded by that uh, culture, which is still very present here in, in Vienna, where I live, and and Prague is very close, etc. But how how did you find? How did you come to Mucha? How how did it all happen that you had that encounter? Um, I I grew up very interested in science fiction and fantasy and a lot of the illustrations that uh, populated those books, I later learned were created by artists inspired by Art Nouveau. What I didn't know at the time uh, was that there was that connection. And so I remember seeing a book on Art Nouveau and flipping through it and thinking, well, this would be what Mars would look like or Atlantis or something fantastic. And uh, I went to, I worked in an antique store and I went to the guy I worked for and I said, can we ever get stuff like this? And he said, oh no, no, that's Art Nouveau. It's too rare, you'll never see it. And so I thought, well, that doesn't sound good. Like I, I wanna see it. And so I, mm -hmm eventually went to work for a gallery that did specialize in that kind of material. And then because my interest was in kind of more the mythological, esoteric, romantic elements of it, I wound up starting my own company that specialized in those elements. Um, but my connection to it was really based in kind of the lineage of imagination, um, reading the Edgar Rice Burroughs novels like A Princess of Mars and mm -hmm. seeing the illustrations from the teens and the 20s and seeing all of the really beautiful, uh, you know, the kind of sinuous and organic line work and and growing up on 70s comic books. Uh, there were artists like Esteban Moroto that were doing things that were so um beautiful to me and I didn't understand as a 14 year old oh it's he's channeling Art Nouveau it's really uh, the Roger Dean album covers it's really interesting to me as an adult how proud my inner 15 year old would be that like mm -hmm. Esteban Moroto is a good friend now um, we had the soft cover edition of Le Pater is coming out in a month and Roger mm -hmm. Dean wrote me a, a great quote saying it's one of his favorite books and certainly his favorite MUCA book um, and Michael Moorcock do you know the author Michael Moorcock and by name I have never read by name he, he created the idea in mm. in pop culture of the multiverse I mean obviously it's a Giordano yes. Bruno idea but yeah. he brought it into <laughs> science fiction literature in the early 60s um, yeah. but he wrote the introduction for the book so all of these things that made me interested in metaphysics and Art Nouveau when I was a teenager I just feel really fortunate that all of the people who are alive that were influences on me um, are all people I've had really great relationships with now as an adult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's fascinating. You kind of re realized your personal dream somehow, didn't you? Yeah, that's that's what I mean. Like, I, you know, I was really um, I mean, the Michael Moorcock story is, is funny that he bought a book and I saw the name come up on an invoice and I, and you know, I, like my inner fan went a little crazy. And I, uh, when it came time to write or to, to release this paperback and I was looking for cover quotes, I thought, well, I'm going to ask him if he enjoyed it. And he said he loved it so much. It would be hard for him to write, uh, just one sentence. And I was like, well, 
you're certainly welcome to write an introduction. I wouldn't turn that down. He said, oh, I couldn't possibly. It would be too much work, but I'll give you give you a nice quote. And so then Mm -hmm. weeks went by and then he wasn't able to pin one down. And he eventually sent me this beautiful, beautiful, glowing two page uh, review of what he thought of my work in the book and um, Mm -hmm. just prefaced the email with, well, it looks like you got an introduction. It was very sweet and very (laughs) offhanded and charming. But yeah, so so my inner inner uh, again, inner teenager has been really feeling very fulfilled that these people who were so inspirational to me when I was young. Um, that those are connections I've been able to make as an adult. And it reminds me kind of of that, that, that leapfrog game. Um, when I, one thing that we did with, with my company is we had a huge presence at San Diego Comic-Con, mm-hmm. which is one of the biggest comic book conventions in the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we would bring all of this Art Nouveau and have this display set up and there are kids that I would meet that five, 10 years later would say, oh, I went to art school because of some of these things that we talked about. And I, we had the first year, really? I remember, a giant Salon Rose Croix poster. So having Buka there in this metaphysical art from the, you know, Carlos Schwab watercolors and and um, Michael Kaluda is another artist that I'm a huge fan of. And he, the first year that we were doing the show, he said, you know, I wanted to thank you for bringing all of this. And I was like, thank me. Like, I'm here because of you. And he said, yeah, but, you know, a lot of us have been pounding this Art Nouveau drum for decades. And it's really we've all been talking and it's really great for us to see someone younger coming in and carrying that forward. And I feel like if you lose your sense of history, I'll I'll put this a different way. The thing that I see in common with with people who are sensitive, with people who are interested in self-betterment and betterment of the world, and I mean it in a meaningful way, like not lip service, something that they all have in common is is a respect and appreciation of art and history. Like it's impossible Mm -hmm. to be connected to those two things and not look at someone and say this person is just part of me, you know, like to look at us as an, mm-hmm. as a larger community, a global community, an eternal community. And so that really was the mission behind me bringing things. It sounds silly, you know, you're bringing fine art to Comic-Con, but it was trying to keep people aware that there is a longer, there's a bigger story. You know, there's a longer story. Absolutely. And trying to get people to tune into that. It's, uh, and I think it's a fascinating approach to do that. I mean, really, really. really. And you can sense that in book, which we are now finally getting to Alphonse Mucha. No, but I mean, I think it was important to draw it, uh, the backdrop to the whole story because um, you could easily talk about Alphonse Mucha alone, but um, um, I think we needed to set that a bit up here. Sure. So, um, well, in, in case that there might be some people out there who do not know enough about Alphonse Bucca, I think what you should do now, um, Tom, is to tell us a bit a uh, background story, also especially related to what you just said, of course, to, of to his Bucca. mystical and spiritualist background, etc. And But give us a, a picture on Alphonse Bucca as a well, personality. Uh, Alphonse Bucca is one of those artists that a lot of people might say, I don't know the name. And then you show them an image and they say, oh, of course, I know that sure. it's 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 very ubiquitous in in being copied and reproduced and people using the style and different things. You can go to a restaurant chain here in America uh, called the Cheesecake Factory, and there's all of this Klimt Art Nouveau kinds of things and elements of. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of things do get appropriated in, in ways you wouldn't expect. And Muka is, is the king of that, because what he did was a very it's a a very futuristic curvilinear sensuality that took Japanism, refined it to a very hyper elegant mindset. And it's it's if you've seen any images with women with big flowing hair, that's very graphic and very linear. uh, That's Alphonse Mucha. He was the first artist to do that. And right. Definitely, if you ever look at comic book art, half of those guys are obsessed with Mooka. Um, 
But so Alphonse Mucha in 1895 it became the illustrator for Sarah Bernhardt, who was the biggest performer in Paris. And what had happened is that the artist who had been doing her posters, uh, the story goes that he drew her a little bit too accurately. And she wasn't necessarily the most beautiful of women. She had a little bit mannish features, some people say. And and so apparently in this role of uh, uh, Joan of Arc, she, she looked a little too mannish. And so she said, find me someone else. So she wasn't pleased. And so there's a, a play called Gizmonda that Muka did the art for. And what happened is he went from being literally an unknown to being the most celebrated artist in Paris in in the span of two weeks. Hmm. And within two years... That's almost as part of the 21st century, which normally you know, wouldn't expect that it happening in the 19th century, right? No, no. And, and especially on a global scale, the fact hmm. that... Um, I mean, it was it was being linked to Sarah Bernhardt, you know, is really what it was. And what sure. he was doing also was so extraordinary. And I don't want to get too far off topic here, but I think this is a good thing to mention as it relates to, to your listener base. Is it something that always happens with Muka is you can look at him drawing a fingernail and there's something about the harmony that's so good that, you know, it's Muka. It's one of those things where it's kind of like if a singer just can fall down the stairs and it sounds like music. Muka just didn't hit a bad note. And so that was something that it's it's the reason that he's so famous. It's the reason that every artist who's any good at least respects him, if not has learned from him. And so one of the things about the book that we'll get into is when you understand that his entire course of his own learning wasn't rooted in classicism, but was rooted in sacred geometry and hermetic traditions and occultism. Well, yeah. now you understand why, like his understanding of nature and of like the DNA of just the way things exist in the world was so intimate and so spiritual and so, um, dense, you know, like really seriously regarded yeah. that that's why, like the art was almost a byproduct of his existence, of his practices. Um, but so then back to Muka, you know, 1895, that happened by 1900 at the World's Fair. He was a major, major presence and defined Art Nouveau for the world. And then by 1902, Art Nouveau was kind of done. And he uh, kind of lived, you know, he wound up then uh, moving back to the Czech Republic and um, mm -hmm. doing finer art. But he kind of had a, a year, that, a, a window of maybe, you know, five years. And it's amazing to think about. It's kind of like when you hear about the Beatles and you look and you realize, oh, my God, that all happened in approximately a five year period. It was like that with Muka. Um, yeah. Yeah. But to sum it up, yeah, he was the quintessential Art Nouveau illustrator, world famous. Um, and uh, to this day, the considered the pinnacle of of graphic design in the era. I may add a little bit of local history here, because um, if I say local, I mean local to me, of course, here over in, in the suburbs of Vienna, because um, Alphonse Bucca, I may say, was born in 1860, about 50 miles north of where I am now here recording this podcast, um, very close to the what is today the Austrian Czech border, which of course was not a border at the time, because this was all part of the Austro-Hungarian empire in 1860 and um, i believe when he returned to as you rightly said the czech republic this was exactly the motivation point he had lost his big moments in paris they were gone and um, the public in in the czech republic had just been founded after world war one and um, he came back and i think one of his first artwork there was one of the first um, stamps postal stamps that were used 
Uh, after World War One, and that were, those were designed by Alfons Bucher. If I'm not wrong, you are a specialist, but I, that's the story. And he I also have. wound up uh, designing currency. Uh, he was obviously the most, on a global scale, the most famous Czechoslovakian. So he, they were, it was very respected and appreciated in his country. And he. Mm -hmm. I uh, was working on what he was trying to raise funds for was a series of paintings illustrating the mythology of his homeland. And so from around 1900 to the end of his life, that was what he was working on. Um, mm -hmm. And then another thing that's interesting is that he founded the first uh, Czech Masonic Lodge. So part of that was, you know, he was bringing all of that back in that had been outlawed. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly the details I, of that, but I know that. Yeah, you might. You probably well, by, do. By the Austro-Hungarian, by the Austro-Hungarian emperors, actually. Yeah, it was outlawed, and we know that very well here. Yes, absolutely. So, so, uh, and and um, the the Viennese Freemasons at the time had to go until 1918 had to go to the Hungarian part of the empire because their masonry was allowed, but not in the northern parts so or not in Austria, not in Czech Czechoslovakia as it was part of the empire. So absolutely. That's why uh, immediately after World War One, he founded the first Masonic Lodge in Prague and then also the Scottish Rite where he was Supreme Commander of in 1922. So that's, mm -hmm. And I believe he was first initiated as a Mason uh, in 1898 in France in the Grand Orient. So that was a big thing at the time. But that shows also a bit, and that's where I want to come to when we will go after the break that we're going to take in a few moments. Um, would like to go to Le Pater, the, the, that, that big book, that famous series of paintings which you present in that wonderful book. Okay, here we go for our usual little break, the music break, as I always call it. It wasn't even easy to find the moments to break here because we were so deep in our discussions and um, very interesting. So um, I hope you're enjoying, just as I do, um, this episode, which is a little bit different than what you maybe are used to here. Um, and now we'll let our guests uh, sing. We heard in that first part that he did some recordings on wax uh, um, as they were done in the good olden times. And well, one of the two songs that we hear now interpreted by him, and I think he has a really lovely and interesting voice. One of those two songs, the second, is actually recorded in that way that he um, talked to us about. So on that, on the wax roll, which, which is used um, to kind of uh, enter the needle enters into the wax and carves out the the waveform that is is, is then reproduced um on the on the disc well i'm sure you know what i mean <laughs> anyway i'm not a specialist but i'm old enough to know how those uh old things were done well i didn't i didn't actually see it happen but um it was a bit before me i'm not that old Right, enough chatting. Um, let's go and listen to that music. And the first uh, piece is not the one recorded on wax. First is a regular recording, which is called New Year's Prayer Lullaby, performed by Thomas Nikoven. And the second one, then, that's the one that he is he has been recording on wax. And the title of that second song that we are going to hear immediately afterwards. So they, they really follow uh, definitely one after the other right away. So the second one is called The Divine Eye. I think that's a really good fit for our podcast here. After our um, second part of the interview, which follows immediately those two songs, we will hear the moon again. Well, um, I told you the very first piece of music here, classical music, was by a French composer, Claude Debussy, who uh, lived during and uh, composed and worked during the time that Mucha was in Paris. And then now we are hearing the counterpart, the Czech counterpart, 
famous Czech composer, um, Antonin Dvorak, and he also wrote something about the moon. And those of you who know opera a little bit might already have guessed it. It's the song to the moon from the opera Rusalka. And those of you who are not opera buffs, I think they might have heard that song already. It's quite a popular piece of music. And if not, discover it and it'll be quite a nice discovery for you. Uh, Lucia Pop, one of our absolutely favorite singers, well, unfortunately, she died already quite a few years ago, is performing. She is from that country, so it is it is a very, a very original performance. Right. So once again, first two songs performed by Thomas Negovan. And afterwards, we return to talk to him during the second part of the interview. And after all that, you'll hear Song to the Moon from Dvorak's opera Rusalka, performed by Lucia Pop. Enjoy! Now Mary, you don't know me, but I've watched you for a long, long time. I have begged and bowed and pleaded and I tried to walk a long straight line. To be worthy of your mercy, I have shed my skin and lightened up my load. But I never had the nerve to bring you home. I've been watching you for lifetimes, I've been spinning like a ship without a sail. I've crossed the moon and mountains and killed the beasts that in my way. To be with your mercy, I have shed my skin and lightened up my load. But I never had the nerve to bring you. Oh, no, it's so hard. 
how would you define Alphonse Mucha's mystical, occult, and so on background beyond sacred geometry? Because I think there's more to it, even symbolism. I, I remember uh, you, pre you also provide a, a T-shirt that can be bought in your museum, uh, which has a, quite an extraordinary <laughs> form of the all-seeing eye on it, which yeah, was designed by Mucha. And so what is, in your point of view, the, how did his um, views on to the, the occult world influence his arts beyond sacred geometry. Can you explain that a little bit? I can't. I, I, I'll say this. The reason I mentioned sacred geometry is, is purely in the sense of um, when he was considering a point and a line and then a third dimension and a fourth dimension and so forth. It's very different when you're coming at it intellectually and with a metaphysical perspective than if you're standing with a charcoal and a piece of paper looking at a statue trying to trace it like he was immediately um you know probably considering the marble from which it had been carved like there were all of these things happening just because of how he was wired and because of what his interests were mm -hmm. um when he I'm not sure if I'm going to answer this correctly. So uh, I, I think that what you're asking is kind of in a general sense where his mind was. Yes. And where would, where you would find his mind in, in his art. Right. He, well, I, I as a, as a person, he was very, very, you know, he obviously grew up in the church. Uh, he talks about in, in his journals, um, loving the music in the church mm -hmm. and kneeling with all of the candles and just feeling like he was on the cusp of understanding or, or experiencing some great mystery. And so as he got older, um, the traditional doctrine wasn't really what was doing it. What happened is when he moved to Paris, he rented a room above a small restaurant where the woman would let you use art as currency. Mm -hmm. And so like Gauguin was a patron there and uh, Strindberg. And so he found himself for the first time part of this community that had uh, different experiences in education than what he had received in Moravia in terms of like it wasn't then at that point just religious. It was now some of these metaphysical theories and I'm sure hearing the name Blavatsky and all of these. Of course. And so he started exploring different traditions, different ideologies. And then when he became successful, his studio became a hub for that kind of activity. So when he moved everything out of the, the place above the creamery and he started um, having kind of salon nights at his studio, there's uh, a gen or colonel named Albert de Rochas, and they did a book together on spiritualism. Mm -hmm. And they used to hold seances and do automatic writing. And he was just very much a seeker into the unknown mm -hmm. um, in every way. And so I think that in the first section, it was, you know, religious. The second, it was kind of a larger uh, opening of curiosities and then kind of accepting everything. And you do see in his art at these times, some of his earlier work that's more illustrative is a little more traditionally religious. Mm -hmm. Then as he starts to get into some of the uh, stranger elements of esoteric, esotericism, you then start to see things come into his line work that don't seem to have a basis in reality in a traditional sense. When you get to I mean, one thing that we haven't said that I, we should say is, is Le Pater is Alphonse Mucha's retelling of the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. And what he did is he took the prayer, divided it into seven sections. And for each of those sections, uh, did kind of a mandala plate that is like a geometric meditation point with elements of, of the symbolism that he believes is surrounding that line. 
then he did an illuminated manuscript page talking about what he believes that line means. And then for the third piece, he did kind of a Gustave Doré looking uh, otherworldly landscape that takes place in some strange dreamscape where there's um, like a giant deity, like for the uh, give us the stair daily bread, there's a large three breasted kind of African earth mother and then people drinking from this fountain, the river of milk. And um, but what he was doing that was most strange for the time is that the deity was androgynous. So it was very removed from the teachings of the Catholic Church. And which again relates, of course, to hermeticism and to, yes. to alchemy, et yeah, cetera. So yeah. That's yeah. where he because in his advertising work, none of it crept in. You yeah. know, when he was doing a beer poster there, it's it's beautiful and it's powerful and it's incredible. And the theater posters, beautiful and powerful. Um, but so what happened with Lepater is because he was famous at this point, he went to his printer and said, I want to create this. I only want to print 510 copies. And because everything that he did was so reproduced ad infinitum, the deal that he made was that once these 510 were printed, that the plates would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And it was purely just meant to be like his love letter to the 19th century mm -hmm. and a message of hope to the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so at the time, I think that I shouldn't even say at the time when you would read about this in books that were published all the way up into the 2000s, no one understood it. People would say things like, oh, and then Mooka just created all of this imagery and it's just weird. And it's like, no, he did not create it. Like all of these symbols mean something. Mm -hmm. But it's that, you know, the first page in, in, in my book um, is, you know, that adage of, you know, he who has a mind to see will see. Um And that it was meant to be veiled. And so it's funny because it was so celebrated and royalty were buying these. He, he tells a story in his journals about being summoned to a castle by, I don't know if it was a count or a prince or someone. And he didn't have any clothes and he's like trying to find decent clothes to go see this person. Well, it turned out the person had a copy of La Pater that he wanted to could assign. And so he was just talking about how that would continue mm. throughout his life to just pop up in the strangest ways. Okay. Um, but even though all of the artworks were on display in Paris at the World's Fair in 1900, everyone talked about it just like, wow, they're really weird and really beautiful. And so it's kind of funny to think about the tens of thousands of people looking at these things and just having no idea um, hopefully through osmosis, getting some of it. But the reason for me writing this book was prior to this book, there hadn't been any study that acknowledged what his intentions were. Yeah. Which to me, you know, was um, important. I mean, it, it's interesting because... Um What he did there, using also the, the, the our Father, the, the Lord's Prayer, um, in that way, was something that's a bit typical for the esoteric occult traditions in France, at least of big bunch of them uh, at that period. Because when you look at people like Josephin Peladon and his Rosicrucian church or the, the French Gnostic church right. we were hearing about in the episode last week. So we relate very well to that when we speak about Mucha here a week later. Um, is is uh, exactly doing the same. You never know, are they actually Christians or are they occultists, you know? <laughs> well, Mucha <laughs> said that he, he felt that uh, Le Pater was a perfect prayer. And I think that when you look at the way he interpreted it, it's almost like um, it transcends any deity, the way he's presenting it, like the ideas, like to each line. Definitely. Um, it's a universe, you know, universal truths. And uh, 
Absolutely. You know, he was one of the rare people that was able to reconcile his Catholicism and his Masonic uh, interests in a way that, you know, were perfectly balanced. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not so sure how deep Catholic he ended up being actually in the end when you when you but I mean, that's my personal interpretation. I have no I haven't dealt enough with him to have any evidence for that. Yeah, I don't I don't I mean, I don't know. I guess I don't know that on a personal level. I do know that when and this is something that uh, we touch on in the uh, hardcover edition uh, but we go into greater detail in, in the paperback. If anybody buys the hardcover, we're making the additional material available as a PDF download. But was that when Le Pater was released in the Czech Republic, what happened is that a publisher pulled um, a handful of copies to be released in the Czech market, is that they insisted on a rewriting of the the pages that he did that were the illuminated manuscript pages and the ideas that were kind of self-empowering the ideas of a of a a less uh subservient can you know like a more of a connectedness were removed in favor of the idea of the hierarchy of of God and man, like one thing that to me is almost creepy is that for the lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, you have the dreaming spirit floating through the ether and there's like hobgoblins and demons all around. And then there's a spirit that's protecting the soul. And the idea in Mukha's verse is that there is, you know, that the it's, it's like, um, you know, like the spirit moves toward the light that like that the idea is that the you know, that if you're if you're trusting in nature, if you're trusting in the course of things that, that there's an ascension to it. Well, in the Czech version, it says now that you're dead, you can better serve God because you're not bothered by anything worldly. And it's so yeah. <laughs> not anything yeah, 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 yeah. to do. Like his, it, his view was so beautiful it, and poetic it, and they reduced it to just this. You know, I, I I'm going to be I'm going to be spit on here, but in, uh, but it's exactly what happens in this part of the world very often till today. Right. Mm. Um, but um, uh, it's very funny you're saying that uh, or relating that to Le Pater because um, very uh, that's all, always uh, things happen very shortly before uh, y y your office contacted me and was speaking to me about Le Pater and if we couldn't do that interview. Um, I was thinking about where does this prayer um, actually come from? I mean, I was raised Catholic, but I, I am no longer a member of any church, right? Um, but um, yeah, same. Um, but um, um, that prayer, as you just said it, to me, it is now having 40 years of occultist experience. It is a self-empowering text. It's nothing else. It's exactly that. The only thing is that even if you research on the Internet, I mean, I didn't do it really in depth. I don't have the time for that. But um, just as you research on the Internet for other topics, you don't find any interpretation in that sense except for Muchas. And um, just take the the last phrase i i'm not now not aware if in the book and um, the uh, the last line of the pater noster is is also there you know which is actually uh uh part of of what is called the kabbalistic cross in 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 um in magical occult circles which is uh, the last line of the pater noster actually but which only but the Catholic Church for a long time didn't use at all. Only the Protestant Church used it. And it was kind of half-heartedly added into the Catholic version maybe 30 years ago. Um, so to me, I'm saying what I'm saying is that the Pater Noster is really that, that the Lord's Prayer is really I, much more, I believe, um, than a prayer to submit to God. And Mucha made that very clear in his artwork yeah. there. Yeah, I agree. And that was, you know, the irony of it being released in his homeland. And they were immediately like, no, 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 this is not subservient enough. <laughs>
But yeah, what he did was beautiful. Interesting that he would uh, accept it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think yeah, what happened, yeah, there was a yeah. publisher named Bernard Kochi who bought 100 copies and released it. And I think, I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know what their relationship was or... I think that maybe he was just happy that it was going to be released there and, and hoped that, you know, kind of that idea of um, uh, better to have 85 percent of it there than none of it, you know, in, in, in the Czech Republic. One thing that's mm -hmm. interesting to me is that the parts that they wanted him to change was just the illuminated manuscript text. I don't know what they thought the art was about, like the parts that are like the the <laughs> the androgynous deity, like it, they completely ignored any of the visuals. So kind of in a um, what's the word in a, uh, you know, in a sneaky way, he got his message into the culture because the only part they were looking at were just his written words. And once he accommodated them in that realm um, and it's not clear if it was demanded or if it was something that he and the publisher worked out and were like look this isn't going to fly it was definitely critiqued uh, as being mm -hmm. inappropriate um, in those quarters but in the entire rest of the world it was uh, celebrated and even in the Czech Republic they do, celebrated do you know it's beautiful do you know how it was received by people in the Czech Republic, like Franz Barton or somebody like that, who, who were very much in the occult at the time, or Gustav Meyrink? Um, have you heard any reactions from any of, of those people? No. No. I mean, I yeah. would imagine mm -hmm. that they were thrilled. I mean, just in the sense of... Yeah. They would have understood it. Would they would have understood... Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that... the lines, of course, yes. Yes. But he was in Paris at the time, and then he, he came to America and was back and forth between, uh, you know, between Europe and America. And I, I don't know, uh, I don't, I, I think it was around 1907. I could be wrong, but when he then started to kind of replant his roots in the mm -hmm. Czech Republic. And I don't know, I actually never saw anything about him interacting with people like my rink now that I think about it. Yeah. I mean, that's right. But even in Paris, like he had nothing to do with Josephine Peladon, you know? So it's yeah, kind of, I know. we yeah. you assume yeah. it's yeah. kind of like, Oh, well, the, you know, these people, it's like, no, it thinking everyone in Hollywood knows each other or something. I think that I, I know that Mooka had a little bit of disdain for the, um, first of all, the idea of art nouveau, he said, art is eternal. How could it ever be new? So he wasn't associated with the gallery that was the Art Nouveau gallery in Paris. Um, and then the people like Peladon, I think he was a little dismissive of people wearing, you know, velvet and corsets. And, you know, it, yeah. it felt probably a little bit theatrical to him, demonstrative yeah. instead of where yeah. I think his head and heart were, which from reading the journals and, and doing the research, it seemed like he was very, um, he took it more seriously than that, you know, like painting. Was he very a, down to earth with that? I, th I think as down to earth as someone who's doing seances and, you know, in his art salon is going to be, but I just think that he was like a, he was a real, I think he was a genuinely curious seeker into the mysteries. I think that his interest in things like Masonic traditions had less to do with the idea of painting a Sphinx, hanging out in a room, drinking wine and talking about girls or whatever they were doing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Like it, sure. it seemed very, yeah. It seemed very glam rock, like meaning when you look at the Salon Rosa Croix, whose work I love. I love those exhibitions. But I mean, it was it was David Bowie and Mick Jagger. It was, you know, they were very postury. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, sure. but look at sure. Peladon. I'm sure your people know who he is. I mean, the guy walked around course, in a course. Syrian beard yeah. and robes and, mm. you know, yeah. was yeah. um, 
you know, he, he was taking it seriously. He was, he was, uh, you know, you, you couldn't, you couldn't do what he was doing in the Masonic community without having uh, that level of discipline, mentally and yeah. emotionally. No, absolutely, definitely, definitely. Um, now let's talk about. The book itself, because I mean, um, uh, we cannot talk about about Le Pater and Mucha without uh, describing the book. It's always so hard to describe artwork on a podcast, of course. So I really would encourage um, uh, my listeners to, if you don't do it anyway regularly, but I fear many don't. So this time, please do go on the show notes page because I will publish a few pages with your permission, just there uh, uh, photographs on off the for out of those books um, that you published uh, and uh, because they're just great and you will then better understand what we are talking about here. Um, on YouTube, we also have, I think, a flip through. Yeah, absolutely. Of the book absolutely. And I will also it. link link that in, in the show notes. Um, But give us a bit of description. I mean, I have that great book here. I think it's 12 on 16 inches, if I'm right, the hardcover edition. The, yes. So it's quite a massive book. And um, uh, it, but it, it, it's, it's, it's so nicely done. It's one, it's a book you just, uh, just touching it makes you feel happy when you love books, you know. And then, Thank of you course, so when, it, when you open it. Um, so you mentioned the the paper recognition. Is it out already or when are you planning to, to bring it? Uh, it should be next month. Um, uh -huh. It should be next month, but I would get in trouble probably for saying that. I would say I should probably say it'll be March. Um, if you get the paper, you can always say if you get the paper those days, people get used to that, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, because I think because it's what's well, been printed. Um, but I don't know what, you know, with oh, okay. congestion and things like that, how that works. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. The paperback edition is nine by 12. Um, we're very happy to have it in a more affordable edition. The intention with this large book was to print the Mooka's artworks to scale yeah. and to make it, I mean, I feel very fortunate to have been able to, to spend years studying the original um, printed version, which has got multiple lithographic techniques and letterpress. I mean, it's a, it's a masterwork of printing. And so we wanted to recreate that as closely as possible. Uh, the paperback edition is, it's still a large book. It's beautiful. It's expanded. There's some corrections, things like that. Um, having the large book is like taking a course in something. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, It, it, one of the things about having the 12 by 16 book there in particular, there were um, some William Blake watercolors that we put in there. There's a lot of things in here that have never been published anywhere before. Yeah. And so I'm really, really meticulous about making sure that the images that we have uh, were the highest quality so that the book printed beautifully at this large scale. The photographs in there are all things that were scanned from the original al album and prints, things like that. But so that this Blake watercolor in particular that was humorous to me was that I was speaking to the, the some gentlemen at the Tate Museum and uh, they sent me the image, the file, mm -hmm. you know, because you, you can license some of these things for a yeah. book like this. And the image wasn't big enough, like to really get the crispness of seeing the brushstroke. And so I asked him, do you have a larger file by any chance? And they sent the larger file that they had. And I was like, it's still not big enough. And Their question was, how big is this book? Like, like, I was like, what are you printing that you need such a high resolution file? And I'm really yeah. grateful that so many institutions worked with me to get things rephotographed specifically for this book to be able to make sure that when you're looking at this 24 by 16 spread, that you really can see the tiny details, things like, um, you know, the, the, the famous 
illustration of the invisible college, things like that. I've always seen it yeah. in books, but it's kind of the low res thing that gets printed. And we really, really blew things up so that if you're interested in mysticism in art, there are some fantastic works in here that you're not going to have ever seen before in this detail. In if this you detail. have not been to, to Tate Gallery and stood there two hours in front of right. you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And it, yeah, and, and so no, the, a, um, no, please go ahead. No, no, I say just two things. It's as close to the original that you can can go in a, in the reprint. I would say. Yeah, so it's it's twelve by sixteen and just over two hundred pages and um, leather bound with you know nice hubs and the whole thing is meant to feel like a nineteenth century book does. Like you know when you go into uh, a library well, or yeah. You know, so it we certainly just worked really it matches, hard. To, it matches the wax recording and the photographs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the paperback is still very beautiful. We did a couple tricks on it to make it feel decadent, but it's a, the, sure. the big hard cover sure. is, is a special experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, have you personally, uh, because we are talking about that period, have you personally made any experiences or, or, or uh, research on surrealism, actually? Any, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. On, have on I, surrealism, uh, have you done any study on that or have you, have you worked on surrealistic work? Um, yeah, not okay. Because it's not. a bit later the period, of course, but, uh, but of course that is a kind of further development of, of that mysticism, um, which then goes deeper into the occult worlds. And many surrealists have been very much practicing occultism. And I just wondered if we, if you had any feeling for the relation that could have existed there. I do not. <laughs> I respect it. Yeah, yeah. Anything before like 1930, I, I, I've studied heavily in. But after that, I uh, my education uh, right, is, right. is severely limited. Now, I have one more question about Le Pater and not, well, on Mucha and Le Pater. Um, what made him choose that text? I mean, yes, okay, let's say his Catholic background, but I mean, there would have been other texts, um, plenty of other texts that he could have chosen. Do you know why it was the Lord's Prayer uh, that inspired him to do that huge work? I think that it's, it, I mean, I, I can say from a marketing perspective, it's a quintessential prayer, I know that he personally said he believed that Le Pater was a perfect prayer. Like it was a perfect lyric, a perfect poem, a mm. perfect. And so I think that when you think of that chapter of his life, growing up in the Catholic Church, having the experiences with Gauguin and Strindberg and then coming to um Freemasonry, I think that it makes sense that it would be that prayer because it, the text is, is so transcendent and it does, I mean, the idea of the father and then him drawing this androgynous, long haired deity, like it's extremely feminine. There's a lot of talk now about the divine mm. feminine and things like that. Like he Absolutely. was all over that at that time. And so I think the idea of that God was beyond gender was so in line with the teachings that he was studying. And the prayer was almost like the perfect subversive bullet to put in that chamber. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, mm. It was not threatening to buy or to look at something about the Lord's Prayer, but all of the information that he was funneling through that, you know, through that bullet wound was was infinitely beyond what mm -hmm. certainly ninety nine point nine 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 percent of anyone who saw it yeah. had any understanding about. Grasped, yeah. Yeah. If he had immediately leapt to. Well, here's a great example. You had artists like. Um, you know, Carlos Schwab from the Salon Rosacroix illustrating things like Hesperus mm. and having all of these uh, things uh, relating to 
the pandragine and androgyny and, and things like that. And it certainly didn't catch on in a larger sense. So Mooka definitely had a sensibility for how to be popular. Um, but all this said, I mean, I realize as I say all that, it's kind of not true. Like a lot of what I said is rhetoric that sounds great now. But at the time, I think that if you asked anybody about Muka, no one knew what Le Pater was. Mm. I mean, it was celebrated, but they only printed 500. Yeah, I was going to say it wasn't meant to be that popular. Yeah. yeah. So uh. if you were at the World's Fair, you saw it. Yeah. But if you weren't at the World's Fair, yes, there were magazine articles or newspaper articles, but everybody saw his beer poster. Everybody saw his chocolate poster, you know? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I do have to qualify that, you know, I don't, I don't want to be too full of myself with talking about Le Pater, like it changed the world. It's, it certainly didn't, you know, but it did for well, him. We are here he to talk a bit that. about it like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would say that, I mean, Muka had kind of the attitude that if, if all of his advertising art was lost to history, he wouldn't care. He considered Le Pater his printed masterpiece and he described it as the thing that he put his soul into. And so that also comes to why I made this book is I thought, All these big hardcover books come out on Alphonse Mucha and they just gloss over the thing that he said to you is his most important work. And who, who and I as, as someone that is a reader, I would read these books about Mucha and just see that there are two sentences about this and think, well, why isn't there more? Like, I want to know more. That's why I spent 20 years researching this. And it seemed criminal to me that this artist that people profess to love, they're not hearing him when he's saying, this is the thing that I put my soul into. And so, yeah, so that's why I... That's three years exactly to write why the, 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 the truth is often hidden, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 well, and also yeah. reprinting them in in the scale to which they were originally both drawn and published meant that for the first time, someone who wanted to really who, who might be as curious as the way I was 20 years ago would be able to experience the artwork in the way he intended without spending twelve thousand dollars to buy one of the original books. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, absolutely, yeah, sure. I mean, at this point, the images are on the internet, but can you really get into them the same way as a super high resolution, crisp scan printed to scale? And the answer is, of course not. No, and it is different still to hold something in hands uh, uh, and to turn pages than, than to... to Wipe. Look on your iPhone. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for that really interesting hour in your company. I'm so happy I didn't use your surname more than once, Negovan, because I would have said <laughs> Negovan all the time. Um, uh, being European, we well, we discussed that earlier. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. And um, oh, Rudolf, um, I'm so lovely grateful to speaking. meet you. No, of course. Thank of you course. so much. So. Not at all. And um, well, good luck with all your future projects. Keep us posted. What's what's on your tablets? And um, yeah, people well, can go thank to you for already what, what you have done so far. Yeah, CenturyGuild.net mm -hmm. is the gallery website, and that's kind of the yeah. hub for for everything. And if you go to lapater.com, that's another place that will lead you. I'll make sure that that all those links will be will be on the show notes so people do go there and have a look. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, have a good rest of the day over there. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Rudolf.
Song to the Moon from Antonin Dvorak's opera Rusalka. Um, I guess you've heard that piece before, haven't you? I'm quite sure. And uh, well, this was our episode with Thomas Negovan and 
about Alphonse Mucha and Alphonse Mucha and his Czech background and his second half of life in what was then called Czechoslovakia, um, of course, gave the reason for that second piece of music. Thank you so much, Thomas, to guiding us through that fascinating life, but especially the fascinating art and the esoteric content of the art of Alphonse Mucha. Um, and please, guys, go to the website, go to the show notes and look up the websites that Thomas has. And if you have possibility to get that book, especially that really, that heart cover edition. It's a beautiful, huge, it is, but a beautiful, beautiful book. And it is really worth the while, I can tell you. Beautiful thing. And the artwork by Alphonse Mucha, well, you'll find it all over the place on the internet, but you'll discover quite a few esoteric things if you go in deep. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you, everyone, to be here for listening and to be with us here on the show. And I hope you will be returning next week, next week for episode 22 of this season seven. Um, and in episode 22, we are going to welcome somebody. Many, many of you know, know him because um, he has been on this podcast, well, quite some time back, I must say. It's almost four years, I think it was. And um, he was also my co-host recently here on the show um, because I was his co-host. And that's where many of you will know him um, because uh, he is the one and only Greg Kaminsky, founder and host of, the o of Occult of Personality, the podcast that was one of the very first and is still one of the greatest podcasts about uh, the esoteric Western world and occultism. So Greg Kaminsky will be here, but not to talk about his podcast, of course, but he recently published his two first books, and we are going to talk about that and also what it means for him to become an author suddenly. Lots of things to talk about, and it's a nice talk, and we always go off into philosophy like Greg and I often do. So I think you're going to enjoy that next week. Okay. That will be episode 22, and this was episode 21. In between, there lies a week, and you spent that week well. Stay healthy and stay safe. And for the moment, I will tell you, take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.